There's one particular person who uh, has had a tr tremendous influence and impact on my life, and especially on this particular study that I want to acknowledge. His name is Dr. Dallas Willard. And it's very important, I think, to take the time to make these kind of acknowledgments. Um, and the first person I want to acknowledge as I start the study is Dr. Willard. He was a professor of uh, philosophy, believe it or not, at the University of Southern California. And I know you're sitting there thinking, my gosh, you learned something from Jesus, about Jesus from somebody who taught at USC in the philosophy department. He was also actually the director of the department for about 10 years. Um, he made his transition uh, into the heavenlies uh, in May of 2013. And other than Jesus, I can tell you no individual has taught me more about being a disciple of Jesus. Uh, uh, although I've never met Dr. Willard personally, although I will someday, but I haven't as of yet. But more than what he taught me about being a disciple of Jesus, the thing that really impressed me about Dallas Willard was that he, he fully lived what he was teaching. And by the way, that's one of the, re one of the things you have to learn about teaching is uh, you can know a lot of stuff, but the power of your teaching doesn't come from anything but how you live what you know. And he lived what he knew. In fact, he, the Holy Spirit used Dr. Willard to create in me a real hunger to know Jesus more intimately and more fully and more powerfully. In other words, the Holy Spirit used Dr. Willard to, to create in me a new hunger for God. And, and that's what happened through his ministry to me. And I really began to understand some of the things that David wrote about when he wrote in Psalm 42, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And then in uh, Psalm 42, verse 1, he says, Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And, and you know the verse, as the deer pants for the, for the water stream, my soul pants for God. Anyway, God used Dr. Willard to create that kind of hunger in me. And this result, called Apprentice of Jesus, is a result of that hunger that God created in my heart and my soul for himself. In fact, I should tell you that Apprentice of Jesus, the, the term Apprentice of Jesus, and then one you're going to hear a little bit later, uh, learning how to live my life as Jesus would live it if he were I, those are both borrowed from Dallas Willard and uh, where I first heard them. However, I, this study is not using any of Dr. Willard's books, although I, I think that would be a good study. Um, this study is about Jesus. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about me in this study, except where my failures and foibles and, and, uh, and uh, um, weaknesses serve as useful illustrations. And I shall tell you, there is a wealth of resource <laughs> in those things for illustrations. But we're going, to meet, we're going to talk about Jesus, and this whole study is going to be about knowing Jesus. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, people who've had a real impact on me in recent years. One of them is Dr. Michael Wilkins and his commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew. He's a distinguished professor of New Testament language and literature at the Talbot School of Theology in Marana, La Mirada, California. Dr. Gary Burge, uh, his commentaries on the Gospel of John really have God used those in my life. He's the professor of New Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then here's a list of others. And by the way, I'm going to give you these lists uh, as we go. Uh, and if you really get hungry for this and want to do some more research, I'll give you the reading list. F.B. Meyer, The Secret of Guidance. Andrew Murray, With Christ in the School of Prayer and With Christ in the School of Obedience. E.M. Bounds, The Power of Prayer. Richard Foster, a classic the Celebration of Discipline, which we're going to look at. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship, and one that's which less known but probably better called Life Together. Brother Lawrence, The Practice of the Presence of God. Frank Laubach, who's a missionary to the Philippines, a fascinating little bitty book, Letters of a Modern Mystic. And I know that may think, what in the world is that about? Frank Laubach was, as I said, a missionary to the Philippines, and he made a commitment to be, be certain that he was thinking about God at least one second of every minute. And he wrote a, a letters to his father about that experience, and that's what this book is. Martin Lloyd-Jones, The New Man in Romans Chapter 6. And as I add to those, I will, uh, I'll add to the list. 
I, I really want to encourage you to take notes as we go through the study. Uh, but I want to ask you to write down what's important to you. In fact, I will tell you, I was working a few weeks ago about developing uh, kind of a little workbook, you know, where you fill in the blanks and you go through the slides and fill in the blanks. And I'd worked on that and I had all the blanks and, and I'd gone through all the slides and made the words in red that go in the blanks. And as I worked on that, I thought, this is not what I want to do. Because I don't know about you, but a lot of us, and I'm one of those, when I got blanks to fill out, I'm working real hard to make sure I got all the blanks filled out. And sometimes I miss what's being said, especially what God's saying to my heart. So I, I, I really felt like the Holy Spirit led me to just throw that away, which I did. <laughs> and we're not going to do that. So what I want you to do, I hope you will take notes, but I hope you'll just write down what the Holy Spirit says to you. Because I want you to listen for him. And, you know, one of the things I've discovered is that I usually get what I'm expecting. <laughs> and if I come in expecting to get more information, I get more information. Uh, or if I'm uh, uh, cynical, I come in and I look for something to be more cynical about. I usually find something to be more cynical about. But if I come in expecting the Holy Spirit to speak to my heart, he does. So come prepared to write down what he says. Now, this is an introduction, and what I want to do today and probably next Sunday is kind of give you a large overview, kind of helicopter view of what we're going to do in this study and where it's going to go and where it's going to take us. And uh, then you might decide after you hear all this, this is not what you want to do, which will be fine. But I, that's what I want to do these next two weeks. And I also want you to know that this is going to be a hands-on study. Now, what I mean by that is if, if you were taking a, well, let's put it this way. If you were taking, um, you know, in Texas we say culinary, and in some other places you're supposed to say culinary. So I'm a Texan, so culinary. If you were taking a culinary class, you'd, this is a class you'd take in a kitchen. This is what the kind of class this is going to be. If you were, if you were uh, taking a class in auto mechanics, this class would be in the garage. That's the kind of class, this study, this is going to be. If you were learning how to be a carpenter, you'd be doing this in a carpentry shop because this is going to be really hands-on. But there is one really important thing by way of introduction I really want to make sure we get, and that's this. This is not a study designed to, to make you try harder to be like Jesus. And let me just tell you, one of the reasons is trying harder doesn't work. It's kind of like learning how to play the piano. I mean, you, you can sit over there on that piano and try hard all day, and it's not going to work. And living to be like Jesus, trying harder doesn't work. So this is not a class to get you to try harder to be like Jesus. And if you walk out of this class feeling obligated to do something, uh, I pray it will not be because of anything I said or did, because that is not the objective of this class. Uh, this is not a class designed to make you feel guilty about something you do or something you're not doing that you should be doing. Now, I realize this is a Baptist church, and we've really fine-tuned the guilt thing here. But this is not a class to make you feel guilty about doing something or not doing something. If you do that, uh, that's not my design and not my intent. Because I want to tell you, feeling guilty won't make you any more like Jesus. Won't help you be a disciple of Jesus. You know, we've heard a lot of sermons on the fruit of the Spirit, and then we've walked out. I don't know about you, I've walked out of those sermons thinking, man, I gotta try I gotta try harder to be a lot more loving. <laughs> or I gotta come on in, I gotta try a lot harder to be a lot more giving, or I gotta try harder to be a lot more joyful, which is kind of an oxymoron anyway. But you know, but trying harder just won't work. It just won't help you. So feeling obligated won't help you either. So I want to be careful that that doesn't creep into this. And let me also tell you, this is not a goal designed, <coughs> <coughs> hear me through on this, this is not a study with the goal designed to make you a disciple of Jesus. <laughs> it's not the intent here. Or even to help you be a disciple of Jesus. Because that's Jesus' job. I can't make you a disciple of Jesus, nor can any study you take. That's Jesus' job to do that. And we enter into discipleship to Jesus when we have a relationship with him from, and so that we learn directly from him. 
And if there is a goal for this study, it's for you to have a direct relationship with Jesus where he teaches you how to be his apprentice and his follower. So fundamentally, the goal of this study is to help you know Jesus more intimately, more fully, more completely, and then through that connection, learning how to be a follower of his and a disciple of his. In fact, I really want you to experience some of the Old Testament prophecies. I want you to be the direct recipient and experience real Old Testament prophecies, like Jeremiah 31, where he said, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his, each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. I want you to experience that. And then Isaiah 30, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. That's what I want you to experience when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. Okay, so let's dig in here. What is an apprentice? We're talking about an apprentice of Jesus. What is an apprentice? And by the way, I teach participatory lessons, okay, which means I like for you to participate. And let me encourage you, uh, the quicker you participate, the sooner we'll get out. So, you know. Someone who learns. Someone who learns. <laughs> Someone who learns, okay? What did they learn? I always think of apprentice as uh, in the olden days when they came over to, to the United States, yeah. they were taught how to be apprentices. Yeah. And they were apprenticed to uh, learn a trade or to be things. Yeah, exactly. And, they, and there's still apprenticeships today. I mean, there's still people today, if they want to learn how to be an electrician, they become an apprentice to a skilled, uh, experienced electrician or a plumber. They become apprentice to a plumber, and there, and there are other skills that we become apprentices to. The classic definition is an apprentice is a person who's learning a trade from a skilled craftsman. If I want to learn a trade, I want to find somebody who does it well, and I'm going to work with them and learn from them how to do that. So if that's what an apprentice is, how would we describe someone who is an apprentice of Jesus? What are you going to learn from Jesus? Learning what he did and how he handled situations. Yeah, situations. How he handled what? Life. Life. Exactly. I would say this. An apprentice of Jesus is a person who's learning how to live life from an expert liver of life. <laughs> In fact, this is the definition I like the best. I am someone who is learning how to live my life as Jesus would live it, if he were I. That is really the bottom line of what this whole study is about. I am someone who is learning how to live my life as Jesus would live it if he were I. So let's ask the question, what would Jesus do if he were here today? If Jesus came to earth, say, and by the way, God incarnate, it's really important to remember Jesus was God incarnate on earth. If he say he was born in 1990, which he could have been, I mean, God could have done this at any point in history he wanted to. But um, he came 2,000 years ago, and he learned to trade. What was the trade? Carpentry. He was a carpenter. In fact, he was known all through his whole life as the carpenter from Nazareth. So if he came today, say he was, let's say he was born in 1990, which today would make him about, what, 27? Eric, is that close, 27? Yeah. 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 He, he could do what you do. If he were here today, he could do what you do. For instance, um, he could um, be a clerk or an accountant or a small business owner or a, a computer repair man. He'd be a good one. A carpenter. He could indeed. <laughs> he could be a banker. He could be an editor. He could build ships and bottles. He could be a doctor. He could... He could be a waiter, he could be a teacher, he could be a farmhand, he could be a lab technician, uh, he could be a construction worker, he could run a, um, a house cleaning service or, or repair automobiles. <coughs> In other words, 
If he were to come today, he could very well do what you do. He could live in your house or your apartment. Live in your family, your surroundings. None of that would be the least hindrance. This is really important. None of that would be the least hindrance to Jesus accomplishing his mission. In fact, it would be the venue through which Jesus would live his life and accomplish his mission. I like what Dr. Willard said. He said, our human life, it turns out, is not destroyed by God's life, but it's fulfilled in it and in it alone. And by the way, I will quote because of Dr. Willard's influence. I will quote Dr. Willard frequently. In fact, times when I'm not aware that I am. <laughs> so if I don't give him credits because I'm not aware that I'm quoting him. So if Jesus did what you do, how would he do it? <laughs> he would do it perfectly well the point is we don't have to guess how he would do it. if jesus did what you do we don't have to guess how he would do it because we know we can know how he would do it and that's what we're going to work on today uh, through this study see we can acquire the skills we're talking about being an apprentice okay and we're going to go back to the carpenter shop often and, and talk about being an apprentice of a carpenter but we can acquire the skills to live our lives as Jesus would live them if he were us, any one of us. We can acquire those same skills. That's what an apprentice is about, remember? Acquiring the skills of an expert craftsman. We can acquire the same skills that Jesus had when he lived his life. So we're going to, take, we're going to dig in and find out what those skills are and how to acquire them. But uh, I want to take just a moment to ask, answer the question, why become an apprentice of Jesus? I think it's important to understand why we pick Jesus to be an apprentice of in our life. Here's some reasons. Number one, Jesus doesn't just know the way. He is the way. John 14, 6. And so when we know Jesus, we know the way. When Jesus doesn't just know the truth, he is the truth. So when we know Jesus, we know the truth. Jesus doesn't just know how to live life. He is life. So when we know Jesus, we know how to live life as it was intended. And by the way, for, for those of us like me who grew up in church, many of you grew up in church just like I, I'm a preacher's kid. Somebody asked one time why preacher's kids are so mean, and I said because we grew up with deacon's kids. <laughs> we didn't ever had a chance. <laughs> and apologies to all the deacons kids in here but if you grew up in church this is something you heard all your life and this is one of the places where that familiarity can be a real liability for instance every human being every one of us has the basic problem of knowing how to live we all have the problem most of us don't learn how to live very quickly I mean we all know the old saying that we are, uh, we grow, uh, let me see if I can get it here, we grow too soon old and too late smart. And those of us who've gotten older recognize how true that is. See, we know how, we have the problem of knowing how to live and we don't solve that problem by ourselves very well. In fact, we really struggle with it. Uh, we've had a while at it actually and we're still not doing it very well i mean if you if you doubt that just listen to uh, the news to get the latest mayhem de jour <laughs> and uh you know quickly that uh, i mean i mean your response is what's going on here the bible says that in jesus day he had compassion on the people because they were sheep without a shepherd i got to tell you sheep without a shepherd are in a whole lot of trouble and that's where we are we're in a whole lot of trouble. Well, Jesus came into that scene in his own day, and he comes into the scene in our day, which is still his day, by the way. And he says, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and take my yoke upon you. Why? The yoke is easy, and the burden is light. And by the way, we're going to learn what that means and how to, we're going to learn how to enjoy an easy burden, an easy yoke and a light burden because we walk with Jesus. But Jesus has put in place a process which results in human beings who know how to live life. 
with an easy yoke and a light burden. That's what this is about. Well, a little quick little exercise. Let's make a list of the smartest people who've ever lived. Who would you put on your list? Smartest people you can think of ever lived. Pardon? Einstein? Whoop, hang on, messed it up here. Einstein? I don't know how to spell Einstein. How do you spell Einstein? That's not it, is it? Einstein. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Natalie? How do you spell Natalie? Who else? Stephen Hawking. Who? Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking? Yeah. H I K I N G. Okay. Who else? Oh, come on. Y'all give me some something easy to spell. <laughs> Can't read my writing, so you don't know if I spelled it right or not, do you? That's why I scribble. Nobody knows. Who else? Who you got? Jesus. Ah, Jesus. Solomon, yeah, Solomon. I, um, oh, in, in the past, more frequently than now, but I used to speak frequently to, to groups of businessmen and I would always ask, well, not always, but I usually ask this question. Give me a list of all the, the smartest people you can think I've ever lived. And I got to tell you, only once in 15 years did I ever hear anybody say Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I'm going to pr propose to you that Jesus is the smartest person who ever lived. And I'm going to tell you that Jesus knows more about medicine. He knows more about biology. He knows more about fi finances. He knows more about business, electronics, about psychology, about physics. I mean, just go anywhere you want to go. Jesus knows more about it than anybody who's ever lived. How can I say that? Well, for several reasons. One of them Paul mentioned in Colossians chapter 1. He said, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And I got an idea that the person who made all this stuff knows more about it than anybody that's ever lived. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're calling, whatever your vocation, whatever your field of service or ministry or work, I got to tell you, Jesus knows more about it than anybody who's ever lived and who will ever live. That's a good reason to be an apprentice of Jesus. In fact, faith could be defined as believing that Jesus is right about everything. Because <laughs> he is. Second reason why I'll be an apprentice of Jesus is because Jesus is the most successful person who's ever lived. How can I say that? Listen to what, listen to what Paul wrote about him. He said, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You cannot be more successful than that. And I got to tell you, none of these guys on our list are going to ever get there. Right? They're never going to get there. Third reason. <laughs> this is not the most interesting man. Nor is this. This is. This is the most interesting man who's ever lived. Why can I say that? Because he doesn't just know about love. He is love. In fact, he loves us so much it hurts. He is the good shepherd. Which is why we never have to want. Psalm 23, 1 says what? For the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, we pass over that so quickly and so easily. We're going to spend some time in that verse, by the way, in a, in a few weeks. But, you know, that ought to just blow your mind right there. The Lord, the one who made all this and for whom it's made and for whom it all consists, Colossians 1, the Lord is what? He is my shepherd. How incredible is that? I shall not want. What does that mean? I shall not want. I got everything I need. I, I try to begin 
my day with Psalm 23 and the Lord's Prayer. In fact, I try to, I try to think about them before I even get out of bed. In fact, at 4 o'clock this morning, I was laying in bed. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I was thinking about it. And that's what David talks about, meditating on the Word in the night watches. And I was thinking, I, I mean, it, if you think about it, it blows your mind. The Lord is your shepherd. Oh, well, we're going to go there. He restores our souls, Psalm 23, 1. He restores my soul. You know, the fact is, is that sin fractures our soul. Our soul can be described as our mind, our will, and our emotions. Uh, any of you ever had the experience where your mind was telling you to do one thing and your will sent you in another direction and then your emotions got involved in it and they just derailed everything? Everything went crazy? That's a fractured soul. That's the destructiveness of sin. Sin fractures our souls. Jesus restores our souls. You know what that means? It means he puts our mind and our will and our emotions all on the same track, going the same direction with the same goal and purpose. You know what you call that? Peace. Peace in your soul. Jesus does that. He's the perfect prototype of the future. You want to know what future is going to be like? You want know what eternity is going to be like for you? Jesus. <laughs> He's the most interesting man. So why Jesus? He is joy. When we have Jesus, we have joy. By the way, what is joy? Let me give you a description of joy. Joy is a pervasive sense of well-being that exists regardless of the circumstance. A pervasive sense of well-being that exists regardless of the circumstance. That's what Jesus gives us. Jesus said, I am come that you might have joy, that your joy may be full. How many of you got, how many of you are full of joy? Full of joy? By the way, that's one of the things we're going to learn how to do. We're going to learn in this study how to be full of joy. We're going to learn how to do that. That's one of the things that Jesus can do. Why Jesus? Because he is purpose. When we have Jesus, we have purpose. He is peace. When we have Jesus, we have peace. He is security. When we have Jesus, we have security. He is courage. When we have Jesus, we've got courage. He's satisfaction. When we've got Jesus, we can be satisfied. He's confidence. When we have Jesus, we can be confident. He's the bread of life. He is the very essence of life and living. Those are reasons to be an apprentice of Jesus. Let me ask you this, and I'm stopping right here. What would the world give? What would the world give to have joy and purpose and peace and security and courage and satisfaction and confidence? What would the world give? He got all those things when he got Jesus. And those are great reasons to want to learn how to live life from Jesus, right? So that's what we're going to do. Next, next uh, Sunday, we'll start with this. Someone who's new to the field, learning the skills needed for the job. Next Sunday, we're going to dig in on what skills we can learn from Jesus on how to live life. And then we're going to move on to learning those skills. Okay? Any comments, additions, corrections? If not, the lesson will stand to prove it's taught. <laughs> By the way, as we go through this, there are probably going to be some things I'm wrong about. The problem is I won't know I'm wrong. <laughs> so I want to tell you, I want to learn. I'm as hungry to learn as anybody in the room. So if I, we go along and I'm wrong about something, teach me because I want to learn. Let me, let me close with this. The Lord, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord caused his face to shine upon you. Amen. Hang on. We're going to spend a lot of time with this too. Okay. The Lord caused his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. Give you peace. Amen. Amen.